We're rolling. Welcome to the REI Rookies Podcast. Real Estate Investing Rookies Podcast, episode number six, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Josh Koth. And I'm Jack Haas. Welcome back, everybody, to REI Rookies. Uh, Thanks for letting us repeat what we're learning to you because it helps us stick in our feeble rookie brains that much more and uh, we really believe a rising tide lifts all boats we're not competitors we're a community so let's share some knowledge and that's what we're here to do so uh, right now we're in the in three quarters of the way through our four-part series of our main exit strategies which were to recap wholesaling quick flipping fix and flip and buy and hold. So this week we're on step three of those four, fix and flip. So first of all, what is a fix and flip, Jack? Well, in in this scenario, we uh, buy a house that is cosmetically uh, poor, that uh, would require a little input or little income to, to actually blah, blah, blah. And then we would do this. Are you sure you're not a trained (laughs) professional broadcaster? (laughs) It would take minimal investment in order to have a big cosmetic impact (laughs) and add additional value to the to the property. Yep. And that's our mantra when we're looking at houses is always structurally sound, cosmetically crappy. And there's two reasons for that. Well, one, structurally the structurally sound part, you don't want to have to deal with a lot of underlying structural issues water damage you know is the basement walls crumbling in is there something wrong with the roof was there fire damage you know because those repairs tend to be very expensive and hard to estimate also not saying that you can't make a bunch of money doing that Um, you could but i guess we're just not to that point where we feel confident you know really taking a chance on those and then to address the second part of it cosmetically crappy so it's structurally sound cosmetically crappy that's good because cosmetic updates are easy to estimate they're easy to do you can you know everyone can put in flooring and paint and stuff like that um you know we can estimate the price easily and those things tend to scare away other buyers which is good so when you're trying to compete on a house to purchase it if Every person that was going to walk in there and potentially live in it walks in and goes, oh, heck no, I'm not living here. This place smells funny, and I'm not living with that orange carpet. We walk in and we say, ooh, orange carpet, great, because we're going to replace that anyways. So all that orange carpet's doing is scaring away other potential buyers. So it really limits the pool of people you're competing against to other other investors or do-it-yourselfers who are going to live in the place. And if you can get you know, get rid of 95% of the market when you're bidding on a house, that gives you a great starting point, right? Yeah. And, and you, that's a good example too, regarding those cosmetics. Uh, we had a property recently that we uh, flip, fix and flipped and uh, they had what apparently looked like they had a number of dogs also living in the properties. Mm-hmm. Uh, dog door ripped off and I, I don't know. They yeah, the carpet smelled like dog, dog stuff. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, you can tell the dogs had just trashed the place. And I walked in and I said, that's that's the smell of money right there. Because, And even our real estate agent who walked in after we'd fixed it up said, wow, you guys really turned this place around. And even he, who you know sees a zillion houses a week, uh, was affected by the change, which... It's you, you can't you have to really have that vision to see past that first impression because when you walk into a crappy house, most people just want to turn around and walk right back out. So you have to be able to see what could this place be um, with some minor fixes. So that's kind of what we look for in a good, for a potential good flipping house. It needs some cosmetic updates, um, <clears throat> but structurally is sound. So one thing that's crucial. Well, like all in, you're going to notice some running themes here. And just like all the other exit strategies, this one depends on getting it cheap. Um, It's just, you know, that's how you make money in this business. Because uh, when you're figuring out your formula for, you know, what to offer, you basically have to start with, well, if this house was all fixed up, what would it sell for? What are comparable houses selling for that are in good condition? 
And for because that based on the neighborhood, the number of bedrooms, etc., that's your top dollar. So no matter how nice you make the inside, you're never going to exceed what the other houses in the surrounding area are going to are selling for. I mean, you can push it maybe five percent or so, but we try not to do that because we want to sell quickly. Also, yeah. So that's really important to note because you want to make you want to be on that lower end where when you price it, it's going to sell really quickly. Yep, and then. What we did was we just took advice from our agent as far as, you know, we said, what's the price where it's going to sell quick? And, you know, we had a few offers within a few days. So <clears throat> we're able to close that deal quickly <clears throat> because when you're figuring out and you know, using fixing and flipping as an exit strategy, speed is crucial because every month, every week that you're holding on to that property is costing you money. Either, you know, the cost of the money that you're using, or did you borrow money from a private lender? Do you have a mortgage on the place? Do you, you know, anywhere, even if you have the money sitting under your mattress, you're, you, there's the cost of opportunity that money could have been earning, earning interest somewhere else. So if you're putting it into this house, even if it's technically costing you no dollars to use that money, it still is costing you. So, and, you know, we either have mortgages or are using, you know, other interest bearing methods, lines of credit, uh, borrowing money, you know, private money, things like that. Um, so that all costs money. So you have to figure out what is your, what are your carrying costs or holding costs per month. So, you know, speed is of the essence when you're doing a fix and flip, because <clears throat> if you're not going to hold on to it and use it as a buy and hold, then really you want to get it sold as quickly as possible because every week, every month that goes by is costing you money. So kind of a quick formula we use when we're um, figuring out what to offer on a, on a fix and flip, if we identify it as that from the beginning, we'll take the comparable houses in the neighborhood, you know, what the bottom end of that is, or even just the middle, somewhere middle to the bottom, and that's our that's our maximum price. That's what we're going to sell it for. And you can always figure about 10% to sell a house, right, of the cost of sale between closing costs, agency commissions, all that kind of thing. Um, and then we deduct the cost of rehab, right? So, and here's another crucial point about fix and flip. You have to be able to estimate your rehab costs accurately because that can just destroy your, your profit margin and that's where I would say a good majority of people lose money when they're trying to flip houses is underestimating the rehab, either the time it's going to take or the materials and labor or both, which would be really devastating. <clears throat> and I think one of the things that we learned in, in this last one is um, we our estimations were pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. It is our eyes were bigger than our stomach. Everyone, as soon as we got in there, it was well. We could do this, and mm -hmm. we can do that, and we kept at. We started to add things on. When you do decide on your fix, your budget, mm -hmm. and the repairs that you're going to do, it's really important to stick to them. And one of the reasons, and just to clarify to the audience, is we kind of changed our strategies. Initially, we thought we we're going to use it as a rental, uh, but then we kind of identified and changed our strategy midstream. So. The repairs we're gonna, we were going to do as a flip differed slightly and required a little bit more to be done because if you're going to flip a house, that requires just a little bit better finishes, a little more attention. It, as an example, if you're going to rent a house, it doesn't really matter if it has an older fridge and an older stove as long as they're functional and you know don't look bad, which these looked fine. Okay, but then we're, if we're going to sell it on the open market, a really nice technique and we mentioned this i think in the last episode or before was you know get some new stainless appliances they're not that expensive but it adds an extra you know over a thousand dollars to your budget so you know that's can be significant depending on how much you'd set aside so that was one thing an example of one thing that we changed between a buy and hold and a fix and flip so you know it's it's great if you can figure all that out before you purchase the property but again if you buy it cheap enough then we still had enough headroom where we could buy a new stove and fridge and still made a, a good profit margin on that one. So <clears throat> anyways, to finish the formula, so basically to reiterate, we start with the comps in the area, the after repair value, and the lower to middle range of those. That's what we're going to be able to sell it for. We subtract 10% for that, subtract our rehab costs from that, 
and then we subtract our profit from that. So we we just kind of throw a figure out there, 20 grand, 30 grand, somewhere in there based on the price of the house. You know, that can be 20% of the ARV, somewhere in there, 20, 25, 30% of the ARV is where we try to hit. So, and then basically, you know, and then we throw in some for negotiating a negotiating buffer, maybe another 10%, and then that's kind of where we'll start. Um, and that's kind of how we arrive at what, at what to offer. And you get some pretty scary numbers. That can, A lot of times we're at half of what the asking price is, right? Yeah, and, and that is something that's a mental hurdle that a lot of people really have to get over. Mm-hmm. You know, we at first we were – our. We're lucky we have uh, real estate agents that we work with. They've, they're they kind of used to it because they they work with other investors. Mm-hmm. So they understand the situation. And in uh, many cases, they're investors themselves. Right. Um, so uh, that's that's all about putting your team together, making sure that they get it. Um, yep. And one thing, like you mentioned, you have to get over that mental hurdle of, okay, this property, the asking price is $100,000. We're about to submit an offer of fifty thousand. In fact, I just looked at some today, and I was going to write up some numbers, and some of them are below half of the asking price. And you know, that's a lot of people just stop right there. They say, "Well, that would never get accepted, so I'm done." You know, I'm not even going to bother. Well, our a large part of our success is we look at that and we say, "Well, okay, that is a ridiculous number, but we're going to offer it anyways because." that's the only number that is guaranteed to be profitable. Are other people willing to make less profit and maybe offer more? Well, if they are, good for them. Um, But we chose to set our standards at such a point where we're going to make only offers that are guaranteed to be profitable. Otherwise, we'll just move on to another house. So, you know, you have to be get over that mental hurdle, as, as you mentioned, Jack, of, you know, this offer is ridiculous, it's absurd, it's insulting. Okay, maybe so, but it's just business. And if if a seller, and this happens sometimes too, when I talk to, you know, because we, we offer property, we make offers on properties on the MLS as well as off. So a lot of times our, you know, on all properties on the MLS, our agent is submitting those offers. We don't have to deal with any of the flack. And that's where it's crucial, to, like you said, to find a good team, find a good agent that's willing to do that. I had another investor tell me that an agent they talked to said, well, I'm not submitting a low ball. I have my reputation to protect, right? Well, that's somebody that's not going to work well with investors, you know, because on, on the typical residential market for owner occupants, you're looking at, you know, if a, people will offer 5%, maybe 10% under asking price <clears throat> and that they consider that to be an aggressive discount, right? Well, we're off, we're, we're offering sometimes 50 to 60% off the asking price. That's, you know, ludicrous in their minds. So you have to find an agent and a team that's willing to uh, just, you know, submit those and and not care and do it with confidence. And that's what we found. And we'll actually be bringing our agent on the on the podcast uh, as our first guest here in a couple of weeks. Um, so anyways, what I was going to say about that's that covers the MLS side of things. But when I'm talking to a seller. Uh, for an off-market property, if we do direct mail or a bandit sign or something, you know, I'm just talking to somebody that directly that owns a property. And you, I, a lot of times I'll just run the numbers for them because then you can walk your way back to the price and you're taking them all along on that journey with you. And they really can't argue with it. Like just the other day, I talked to a gentleman and <clears throat> I think he wanted 160000 for his house, that it was a rental house. And he was looking to kind of retire from being a landlord and he started telling me all the features of the property and i said well just let's just start with what it rents for right and he said a thousand dollars so then i did our quick formula of you know well you can throw away 40 percent for expenses so we're at six hundred dollars and then you can take you know i forget the exact top of my head but i would basically uh, we like to make about 18 percent for profits as 180 dollars so we're at 420 i said that's the amount we can pay for debt service and then that through you know you can back your way into a purchase price from that it was about 96,000 okay and because if you're going to have a pro- a mortgage on a property of that price and where the payment is about 420 a month that is a mortgage of about 96,000 current market conditions that um, the loans were able to get so you know the 
the rent does not justify a higher than $96,000 purchase price. If we paid more, we're either breaking even or actually losing money every month. So why would you ever go ahead with that deal? And I just, I worked back from there and I said, well, according to our formulas, we could, we'd be at right around 96,000. And, you know, he thought that was ludicrous because he's asking 160. So you're talking, you know, uh, 40 to 50 percent approaching discount and <clears throat> he wasn't wrong because on the open market he might be able to get that to an owner occupant so neither of us were wrong we just need to find somebody that's willing to trade equity for speed and for cash you know because that's what we can offer is a quick close um, all cash offer will handle all the closing costs everything like that so you know, that's what you have to find somebody that's willing to trade those. Otherwise, you, you're not going to arrive at a deal. And he he looked at my numbers and <clears throat> didn't disagree with them. He said, yeah, I mean, you're not going to make any money if you pay more. But I can maybe get more in the open market. So in a situation like that, you just want to, you know, move along and talk to the next the next owner because there's, you're probably not going to make, make a deal there. But we always talk to everyone. So, so that's kind of how... You, that mental hurdle, you just have to get over that and you can work your way back to a purchase price from either what it rents for or what you can sell it for. And this week, since we're talking about fix and flipping, you need to look at those comps, what a, a fixed up house in that neighborhood will sell for. And that's really where you start basing your price on. So uh, with the, the last one that we did, what was the, one of the most surprising uh, lessons that you learned from it? Do you well, <clears throat> like you said, once you start fixing things, there's always more you can fix. You know, you have to know, how do you know when to stop? What is considered as a sufficient rehab level to that it'll sell when people walk in and it looks appealing, but yet you don't go overboard because at some point it's a, it reaches a point of diminishing returns. I mean, we could have landscaped it. You know, we could have done a lot of things uh, that we didn't do but at what point is that going to keep bringing you a higher purchase price you know so that's it's really hard to uh you had kind of have to go with your gut and experience and just figure that out um as an example i you know i've, I've really been thinking about curb appeal that's one thing that is so crucial you know they, they say that people make their decision about a house sometimes right when they drive up and that's it I mean, I can, from personal experience, when I was buying my first house, you know, back in 2003, we looked at a whole bunch of houses and my wife, we drive up and she would just go, nope, like right out of the gate. So, you know, you have to think as a seller, if you're going to put this on the MLS or, you know, sell it by owner or whatever, how can you make this house appealing in the quickest way and cheapest way possible? So on one I just sold um, here in town, it was an older house in a you know not a very expensive neighborhood, but and I drove I drove by it a few times and just kind of like glanced at it from from my car and thought you know what could I really do to just spruce this thing up with very little money, so I the foundation had paint on it and it was all cracked and peeling, so I just bought a gallon of black you know outdoor exterior paint, painted the foundation black so it looked nice and shiny and glossy and and you know even though it was. A really old house it really you know finished it up nice um and then i bought some of that landscape edging and then threw some mulch down and we don't have blooming flowers yet up in here in fargo north dakota but i bought some just planters and and a couple green bushes and I actually bought some artificial flowers because i literally went to greenhouses and i said i need some color in, in the front of this house and she said well we don't have any colored blooming plants yet so you're gonna have to go with artificial and i said all right that'll work and that house sold, we had four offers in, in the first day. So I think that that curb appeal piece really had an effect. So that's one thing that I'm really paying attention to. And, you know, I think we'll have to include in all future flips because it was so cheap too. It was probably like, you know, maybe 300 bucks total between planters, artificial flowers, mulch, edging, paint, all this stuff. And, you know, what if it changes that first impression, that's a huge benefit. So that's something, you know, that to definitely consider. Of course, time of year matters. You know, if it's the middle of winter, it's a little bit tougher to deal with that. But on the flip that we did in the one we were talking about previously, 
it did have uh, some really crappy back stairs and front stairs. So we hired a carpenter to come in and make nice wooden, a little deck in front. It's just basically a glorified step, but it, it just cha it changed the how the, the curb appeal from the street. So I think that that's surprising to me is how, how much that effect affects potential buyers. Yeah, when we're dealing with that lower cost uh, property too, you know, in this market, it's those properties in that 150,000 uh, price point. And then just to let our listeners know, up here in Fargo, North Dakota, I think the average home price is right around 250, and it's been climbing rapidly. So you know, we deal in you know below that for sure. Um, I mean, we've never sold a house for more than 140. I don't think have we. No, that'd be about it. Yep. So that's yeah. kind of that's well. It was one forty nine, right? Yep. I guess. I guess so. Yep. So that's that's kind of what uh, you know what price range we're dealing in here. So you get a, a sense of the relative market. So on those lower cost properties, you're typically typically dealing with those first time home buyers, and it's kind of easier to stand out in that market because you know you go into a place that we've just rehabbed. It's got new stainless steel appliances, new flooring throughout, new paint throughout. It adds a lot of value because these people who are likely going to be moving into those properties don't have the money to put in new appliances or put in new flooring right away. Yeah, a lot of times their loan and their payment, they're right up against the maximum. So like we've had offers come in where they say they literally can't offer any more than this because that's all their bank will allow. So, you know, it's crucial that you add as much value as you can. So when they walk through the property, they're saying, hey, this is this thing's ready to move into. We don't need anything. So, you know, another area where you could you could really, you know, save some money is just having some laundry hookups, but not necessarily have a washer dryer. Right. Just that, that you have a nice laundry area. And like we moved laundry hookups in this last house and we made a nice area where, hey, there's your washer and dryer ready to go right in there. But, you know, we're not providing them, but they, they see that and they don't, that's not, a, that's a positive to them. So that that's one, you know, one way that, whereas some other flippers might throw a washer and dryer in there. Um, I typically wouldn't suggest that. So, you know, you have to really know, like, is this thing, this item I'm putting in either going to increase the value of the house or make it sell quicker because it's here? It's got to do one of those two things. Because there are things you won't get your money back on dollar for dollar. Um, but it might help the house sell quicker, which sometimes can be just as important. And in fact, one thing you want to one thing you want to do when you're walking through your property is is say, is there anything in this house that'll keep me from selling it? Like it's going to turn a buyer off. And even if it's not in the budget, you know, we need to find a way to address this or deal with it. Well, in in our <laughs> in this last one, you know, the the dog thing was a was a big problem. So they had a gate or something between the kitchen and the living area that and it really chewed up that that uh part of the wall so we just yep. just just recutting some pieces of uh, trim and uh painting it white to match everything it, it really cleaned that area up quite a bit or even like the dog door technically we wouldn't have had to have gotten rid of that um, but we replaced race with a new door because you know it just looked better, and we, we felt that was money well spent, even though that may not get us as many dollars as we had to put into the door back. You might not get that back and per an increased purchase price, but that's an example of something that is going to stop, maybe stop somebody or turn them off just enough to move on to the next house. And you always want to make it easy for them to say yes to the house. So new appliances, you know, um, good curb appeal. Um, and you know, laundry hookups, uh, new new paint, new carpet, all all those things add value and make it uh, much easier for them to say yes. So, and I think I think it's important to state that it's kind of like having a level of consistency throughout the house, because like you said, that back door had that dog door that was broken. Uh, we probably didn't have to replace it, but replacing it increased the level of consistency throughout. Because if we would have had left that door on the back that's the that was the worst thing in the house and that's what people are going to remember yep you know so you want that level of consistency a couple of things that i think that 
we noticed when we were looking at properties that got our attention that in the end would be a low cost way of adding significant value was we went to a hot one property and all they really did was uh, gloss paint the basement. Mm -hmm. It really made that area clean looking and all of a sudden usable. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times basements up here in this area of the country can be dingy, dirty, messy, and, you know, you don't look at them as a positive. So, yeah, one house we looked at, I remember specifically, they had, like, just spray painted the whole basement white, you know, and then obviously had cleaned power washer or something pri previous to that. So it really looked like, wow, this is actually a great place to store things and didn't look scary, dark, musty at all. It really cleaned it up. <clears throat> and I thought... You know, we kind of filed that away mentally, like, hey, if this is possible to do in future properties easily, let's do it because it really, because a lot of times basements up here can be a negative. You know, the basement might be what kills the deal, either for structural reasons, water, water leakage reasons, or just, you know, a, appeal aesthetics. So if there's a way to eliminate that and put that into the good column and the pros column instead of make it a con, turn it from a con into a pro. <clears throat> then that's a great great thing to do and you know it's probably not that expensive to do either obviously you know every house is specific but um, another thing with flipping uh, you know fix and flip or flipping I mean it's a heavily competitive strategy uh, there's that's something you have to consider too so you really got to be conservative when you're uh, checking out houses and making offers think of all the flipping shows on TV right now um, you know, there's so many of them and people think, Ooh, flipping houses would be fun. You know, I love to pick out what kind of backsplash and what kind of carpet and paint and everything. Ooh, fun, fun. Well, you know, a lot of times people just get caught up on the design aspect of it. And one thing you have to remember is you're not living in this property, right? So you have to make this, uh, generically appealing to the most amount of buyers you can. So you have to stay away from wild paint colors, wild carpet you know, colors and wild patterns and things. Um, unless that's a, like your signature move, you know, like if you have a zebra pattern backsplash or something and that's your signature and they say, Ooh, it's, it's one of their houses. That's cool. You know, I, I understand that, but our strategy is we want to appeal to as many buyers as possible. So, you know, you'll paint with very neutral colors and you know, that that's very tip, very typical safe way of doing things too. So, um, and just to speak to the competition aspect of things, I remember I looked at a foreclosure recently. And when I got there, there was another investor that I happened to know parked outside waiting for his agent to show up. And then there was another one in the driveway. And this is just at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. You know, wasn't like, hey, we're doing all showings now. It was just a random Tuesday afternoon. And there was three other people looking at the same property because they're all thinking the same thing. Ooh, this would make a good flip. So, you know, that's it's a real competitive strategy. So not every property will, will make sense for that, but it's something to definitely keep in mind. It's, it's a competitive environment out there. Yeah. If you, if you are a member of any kind of real estate meetup, I think we've all seen it where, uh, there's a, there's a couple there the first time there that you've ever seen them. And it's, it's all about flipping a property and you might see them once or twice and then they kind of fall off the radar. Yeah, I think a lot of people but, think it's it'll be a fun hobby or something. Yeah. And they also think that, well, and this gets into, you know, like we spoke of earlier, estimating your rehab costs is so crucial. Uh, the, another major component people forget about is the labor, right? Now, are you going to do all the labor yourself? Well, if so, you should better assign yourself an hourly wage and keep track of that because – you know, that can really destroy your, your profits as well. Like even when we're working on a property, painting or doing something, we try to hire most things out. But when we're working on it too, we try to track our hours and that way we can say when it's all done, okay, you know, the labor cost was X, you know, and it's a true reflection of what it costs us and not, uh, you know, just the materials because, you know, the, that, that time is valuable and, the highest and best use of our time is probably finding the next deal, not painting a wall. So, you know, we try to, if we're doing that, we need to know what, what's that costing us right now. So that that's crucial. And that's, I think why a lot of the hobby hobbyists kind of fall to the wayside after one or two flips, because they typically 
when they look at their real numbers, probably didn't make any money. You know, if you once you factor their time into it, and you know, I, lots of people say, "Oh, well, I did it all myself." Well, if, you, if it's six months of every night and weekend doing it, that's not a true reflection of your profits. You, a lot of times when you run the numbers, you say, "Well, you would have been better off just working a shift at Starbucks twice a week instead of spending all the time in the house." And that's not a place where I want to be at. I want to, after it's all said and done, including our labor and time and cost of money and everything else, that we have made a true profit when it's all said and done. And in order to do that, it requires a really deeply discounted purchase price. And there we go. We're back to our mantra, right? You got to buy it cheap. So uh, let's move on to the uh, next part of our of our weekly podcast, we talk about a REI specific tip of the week. Do you happen to have one this week, Josh? Otherwise, I might have something. Go for it. Well, here's my tip of the week. When it comes to flipping anyway, or um, any kind of situation where you're putting in new flooring, we we found and we actually got some comments about it. Uh, the one that we recently flipped, we had some shrink wrap. It was like a wide piece of tape that we laid down and i suppose what was it two three feet wide right yep uh, basically to protect the carpets it makes a, a walking lane on the carpet and my uncle who was our general contractor put that down to protect the carpet you know just from being walked on as we we're fixing our last few things and we left it on there we thought wow this really makes it look like this is a new house. Like, yeah, ooh, they it looks to, like it's shrink wrapped. Yeah, they get to unwrap their house. And I also made a point of on um, when the stainless steel appliances were delivered, I left some of that shrink wrap that they put on the you know like the glass surfaces. So you know it just makes it look that much newer. And I left some of the tags on there and the owner's manuals right by them. So it really gives that psychological appearance of you know hey these are brand new and this is this is a brand new house it's got shrink wrap on the carpet and i mean it's just a roll of plastic stuff that's probably you know costs practically nothing to put down but it just gives that appearance of this is freshly installed it's new you know and then when they get they move in they get to tear the shrink wrap off and so that's something that i think we're going to do every every time we do a flip because uh, i think psychologically that really work can work in your favor yeah so don't Resist. Don't don't pull that uh, that shrink wrap off those new appliances and stuff. Keep it on there. It's, it's doing more good in in other aspects. Exactly. All right. Well, that concludes our uh, REI specific tip of the week, and now we move on to the coach's corner. So something that's a personal development tip, a book, a quote, something like that. And Jack, you you're two for two this this week. You have also our coach's corner tip. Yeah, I went through a book uh, that was actually recommended to us by um, our realtor. Uh, it's called Edgy Conversations by Dan Waldschmidt. Um, what is, uh, we've seen a lot of these type of books before, but this one really tackles the concept about what is holding you back, and it's typically the baggage between your ears. You know, we, we talked earlier about getting over that hump of, offering a, a throwing in low offers mm -hmm. um this has a lot to do with that so uh would recommend everybody taking a look at that we'll have a link to it uh on amazon in our show notes edgy conversations by dan waldschmidt recommended by our realtor we'll have him on the podcast in a couple of weeks he's a it's funny because he loves to share book recommendations so we trade a lot of those with him so and that's that's a sign of a, a person you want to be around, somebody who's always learning, always widening the horizons and trying to improve personally as well. So that's great. All righty. Well, I think we better wrap it up because we're past a half hour here. I think we hit a new record. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure you check us out on Twitter at REI Rookies. Remember, get off the bench and get into the game. We'll see you next time. Oh, <laughs> remember, uh, don't just stay on the bench. Get into the game. 
screw that up. Yes, you did. <laughs> Let's do that one again. Sibilance, sibilance, check one, two, test one, two. <laughs>